teaching virtualization. And when we started out, <coughs> last season I had a bit of a cold. Um, I'm up in Canada where if you don't like the weather, just wait a minute. So um, when we started out a decade ago, VMware really ran the, ran the show in virtualization. There was nobody who came close. There was nobody who had a close competitive technology. And so many of us invested so much of our time learning VMware, investing in VMware infrastructures, and it just made sense. But the reality is, is that where we have to stay? Now, I like to tell people, Wow, I've been talking about virtualization for a decade and telling people for 10 years that you should virtualize. But guess what? Virtualization isn't our goal. It's a pit stop on the road to the cloud. And the difference between virtualization and the cloud is, well, flexibility and fabric. In my cloud, I don't know where my servers are. I don't even have to know where they are geographically. I just need to know that I can ping my machine and it's going to work, and I have high availability, and I have flexibility, and I can grow and expand and shrink as needed and pay for what I'm using and not for, uh, for what I need sometimes. Imagine an accounting firm. <coughs> accounting firms in Canada are really, really busy the month of March and April, and in May it papers off, and for the next nine months they're doing nothing. Imagine having to buy servers that you're going to use two months of two and a half months of the year. So being able to grow and then shrink back is really important. So virtualization is great, but cloud is going to make a lot more business sense. Now, in our environments, whether you're running VMware or Microsoft or Citrix, you're using a tool to manage your VM your virtualization environment. Imagine. In VMware, you're using vCenter server. And then we have to manage our servers, both our physical servers, our HP, our Dell, our IBM, or whatever else they are, and the operating system, whether it's Windows or Linux or older or newer, whatever it happens to be. And then we have networking, and that's going to be on our Cisco or HP or Juniper or whoever else. And we have another tool to manage that. We're up to three or four or five by now. When we go to our applications and on our servers, our databases, our web servers, our mail servers, and our clients, whether they're virtualized clients or physical clients or VYOD devices, whether they're Windows or Android or Mac, and of course storage, and we've got another dozen vendors there, and of course our backup. I just mentioned seven different aspects that we have to monitor and if you've got a heterogeneous environment, if you have Windows and Linux and HP and Dell and HP and uh, Cisco and Apache and Exchange, you're already talking well over a dozen tools that you need to manage and monitor all of that. Now, as an IT professional, I have to admit, I didn't come out of the Army and say, hey, I'd really like to work really, really hard, come home, uh, sweating every at the end of the day after, and collapse into bed. I'm a bit of a lazy guy, so if I can have a single pane of glass that's going to manage and monitor all of that, that is going to make my life a lot more palatable. palatable. And here is where the Microsoft solution rocks. System Center 2012 is going to manage and monitor all of those. Now, I'm not saying it will only manage and monitor the Microsoft site. You may decide today that, you know what, I'd like to look at System Center, but I still want to use the VMware infrastructure. System Center will monitor and manage that. You may stick to some Linux servers. No problem. System Center will do that. You may need to deploy Android uh, operating systems. Okay, no problem. System Center can monitor and manage your entire IT organization, and that's going to make our life a lot easier. Now, we talk about Windows Server 2012 as the operating system built from the cloud up. It really is just this wonderful operating system that's going to help me to implement that single pane of glass. Now, when I talk about the single pane of glass, I'm not only talking about my physical hardware, because so many of us are moving into the public cloud. Now, we have 
systems and servers running on Azure or Amazon Web Services or whoever else. We may have local and remote service. Well, the fact that I can manage all of those from one single pane of glass and not even worry whether they're local or remote, whether they're on physical hardware or virtual hardware, whether they are on my metal or in a public cloud, manage them all the same way. That's going to make my life just so much easier. Now, I keep talking about making my life easier. I don't want to give you the impression that just because it's easy, it's not really robust. We are going to get to that, and we're going to talk about that in great detail. But I listened to Sean's webinar earlier today just to refresh, and I heard some of the things he had to say about VMware, and you know what? I am a very unpopular guy at Microsoft Canada because I don't have a bad thing to say against VMware. VMware makes solid products. They make excellent products. They do great work. And if you've invested in that infrastructure, you are, well, you remember the old expression, nobody ever got fired for buying IBM? In the virtualization realm, nobody ever got fired for buying ESS or vSphere. <laughs> until somebody got fired for buying IBM, until somebody realized that a digital mainframe would do as good a job, until somebody realized that in the PC realm, Compaq was better than IBM. And then all of a sudden, the paradigm shifted. And that's where we are today. We're at this place where Hyper-V has grown up to really compete with the big boy. And... I, I've been teaching Hyper-V since the inception. And five years ago, and four years ago, and three years ago, I had to always qualify everything that I said with an apology. I used to have to say, you know, Hyper-V is not quite as good as VMware, except look at the price. And when Server 2012 was released, and Hyper-V 2012 was released last September, I, I changed that message to... Look that we are on a parity with VMware and look at the price. We are delivering functional parity to vSphere. We have live migration. They want to call it vMotion. We call it live migration. We have live storage migration. We have live network migration. We have shared nothing live migration. And by the way, <clears throat> if you're just starting out and you want to learn it, you don't have to go by server-grade hardware to run it, you can install all of this on any hardware that is on Microsoft's hardware compatibility list. It, it runs Windows, it will run Hyper-V. How cool is that? You can get started a lot cheaper than you were able to before. And higher maximums means even greater enterprise scalability than these. Let me show you some of these numbers. You know, one of the arguments that VMware religionists have been making over the years is that Hyper-V won't be ready for the enterprise because it's not enterprise scalable. Well, let's look at these numbers. You know what? On logical CPUs, we're double. On physical RAM, we're double. On virtual CPUs per VM, we're double. On active virtual machines per host, 1,024. And maximum virtual machines per cluster, 8,000. <coughs> So what do these numbers mean? On the one hand, yep, we are higher than VMware, than vSphere 5.1. And on the other hand, who cares? It's irrelevant. This is all marketing fluff. How many of you have 320 logical CPUs in your hosts? How many of you have 4 terabytes of RAM? By the way, if you do, I would love to come over and play. I'll even bring the chocolate milk. These numbers are irrelevant, except to show that Hyper-V can deliver a parity to VMware. We are on par with VMware. And if you want to talk about large networks running Hyper-V, I hear people all the time telling me, you know what, every company in the world runs VMware. Well, that was true. But at this point, we are at, well, I think Hyper-V is in about 25% of companies who are really going up at a great rate. I'll tell you that VMware's memory tax last year helped us greatly. I'm not going to lie, we were dancing in the streets. 
But if you want to talk about large networks that run Hyper-V, that run these, Microsoft eats its own dog food. Let me share a couple of interesting numbers. Have you ever gone to Microsoft.com and gotten a server busy error? We are held to a different standard than everyone else. Why? Well, <laughs> let's admit it. We are the biggest player on the block. So when we talk about a company that runs Hyper-V in a full private cloud environment running Hyper-V and System Center, look no further than us. We are one of the largest distributed sites on the Internet. Outlook.com, what you used to call Hotmail, Office 365, Bing. And here's the one that I love. Uh, there's, there's one statistic that I got that we serve five petabytes or six petabytes of data. That in and of itself, when you, when you use the P word, petabytes, people start to look up. Now let me put some constraints around that five or six petabytes. That was in 2011. But it wasn't all of 2011. It was only for Xbox Live between the week of Christmas and New Year's 2011. Five to six petabytes of information served and everybody playing their games got their information. Don't talk to me about high availability and Microsoft isn't a player until you go to Microsoft.com or Xbox.com or Office365.com or Hotmail.com and get a server busy error. And of course, security, we'll talk about security later on. Virtual networking, God, I love virtual networking because VMware, when I took my VMware course, it was a full day of networking and a full day of storage. I am going to admit to you right now, their virtual networking is more robust than Microsoft's. And with that being said, robust doesn't mean functional. We have the same functionality in our networking as they do. In fact, it can be as easy or as complex as you need it to be. So if you need it simple, Go into your Hyper-V manager and create a virtual switch. If you need the full functionality, invest in the Cisco Nexus 1000V extensions. Invest in the F5 virtual extensions. We have several partners delivering virtual switch extensions that can make your network sing and segregate and VLANs and everything that you could possibly need in networking. However, if you don't need all of that, You've already invested in your physical infrastructure and you know that your physical networking is doing everything it needs to do, keep it simple and it will work just as well. Now, cloud computing is important because I discussed this before. We have to be able to take our pooled resources and spin them up and bring them down and only pay for what we're using. We also need to be able to do self-service provisioning so that our end users or our app owners can spin up the clouds that they need. So we talked about System Center. And I want to be clear. I listened to Sean's webinar, and he doesn't differentiate between the free ESXi hypervisor and the paid vCenter server solution. Both excellent for what they do. I would, talk, I would say that if you're going hypervisor against hypervisor, Hyper-V wins hands down. If you're talking management solution, well, then we have to determine what your needs are and then determine that system center wins hands down. So let's talk about <coughs> a scenario and how it works because we used to have seven different system center products and in system center 2012, they all been brought into one product and let me show you how they work together. You have an app owner who needs a new cloud they go into a self-service portal in, uh, on their computer and say, I need A, B, C, D, and E. I need a domain controller. I need a web server. I need a .NET server. I need a SharePoint server. I need a SQL server. Whatever their requirements are. I need it at this level, whether it's gold or platinum or silver, depending on what our hardware availability is and how much resources they really need. It comes to us and we approve it, and it goes into a service automation, service delivery and automation process that spins it up, provisions it onto our Hyper-V hosts, 
whether that's on our bare metal, on a third-party provider, on Microsoft's cloud, on Amazon's cloud, or our metal in another data center, or local, of course. Once it's delivered, we have to, out of the box, be able to secure it, monitor it, watch it, and keep it working. So now that I've told you what our goals are, and your goals may not be quite as complex, but <clears throat> we have the ability to do all of this, let's now productize this. I talk about the seven components of System Center. Here they are. The self-service portal that our end users are going to go into is called App Controller. App Controller provides the online portal for our app owner to go into and requisition what they need. Once we approve it, it goes into Orchestrator. Now, Orchestrator, I like to compare to a marriage between Physio, the office product that allows us to build workflows and diagrams, and a scripting tool. Imagine if you built your Visio diagram of your entire domain, then press the button, and it built it for you. Well, that's what Orchestrator does. It will spin up everything, your domain controllers, your, your application servers, your database servers, your multi-tiered application servers, all together as one entity. And it will place it wherever it needs to be. Now, of course, Orchestrator is essentially a scripting tool. It uses what are called runbooks. And these runbooks are uh, processes that we've designed. And in order for it to build out our virtual machines, it has to interact with a third system center component called Virtual Machine Manager. Virtual Machine Manager is our uh, is the Hyper-V equivalent of vCenter server. And it is going to build up from our library templates our virtual machines, our virtual hard drives, it will spin them up and configure them and place them where they need to be. But how does VMM know where they have to go? Well, that's where we come into our fourth system center product, which is called System Center Operations Manager, what used to be known as MOM, Microsoft Operations Manager. MOM keeps track of our entire environment, and it watches everything, and it literally is this great management framework that will monitor our hosts and our monitor our virtual environments and all of our resources and tell Virtual Machine Manager where it can intelligently place all of our virtual machines. But the problem with that is before, as soon as we release an operating system, whether that's Microsoft or Linux or anyone, Within a few days, it is no longer secure. The minute somebody has found a compromise to it, it's no longer a secure operating system. So in order to make sure that our deployed environment is secure, it has to interact with a patch management tool, and that's going to come from System Center Configuration Manager. That's product number five. System Center Configuration Manager does a plethora of things, but one of them is called patch management. It does that. It does security, the system center endpoint protection. It does desired configuration manager to make sure that our servers not only get deployed securely and patched up to date, but they remain secure and patched up to date throughout their life cycle. We have to continue monitoring all of those machines, and that's where the operations manager agent comes in. But to make sure that they have the best security out there, System Center Configuration Manager does that. Now, product number six is called System Center Data Protection Manager. Data Protection Manager, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, protects our data. It's a backup tool, and it's a very good backup tool, but I would pause it just as I would pause it if I was teaching a VMware class, that there are third-party tools that do a great job as well. So don't be limited to just saying, okay, I'm going to Microsoft to let you DPM. If you have a heterogeneous environment, if you have some ESX and you have some uh, Hyper-V, if you have some Microsoft and you have some Linux, I would look at tools like Beam Backup and see what they have to offer. And whatever backup tool that you have, just make sure that you test it to make sure that you can do test restores on a regular basis. Product number seven is called Service Manager. Service Manager 
is behave. It is a ticketing system. It will let us tick, uh, let us throughout the course of the life cycle or the life of our system, let the app owner ask us questions. They can submit tickets, say, hey, I don't know where the any button is, or hey, I'm not delivering emails, or oh my god, my screen has gone black with a big uh, black uh, uh, skull on it, and it's laughing at me, and I can prioritize my response as the data center administrator by looking at these uh, requests. As well, Service Manager is also a change management system. I always laugh when I walk into a company, how many companies have you gone into as a consultant and seen they have this great binder that outlines exactly what their data center looked like two years ago? Well, Service Manager allows you to maintain an up-to-date system by using the change management, and that really does help us. And this is going to really take us from the application management and the infrastructure management all in one tool, that one single pane of glass that is so important to working smarter and not harder. So we can have our private clouds, and we can spread it geographically. I can have two data centers. one in Toronto, Canada, and one in Denver, Colorado. And if my production environment is in data center one and data center two, and my dev environment is in data center one only, if data center two goes down, dev is fine, production is fine. And the people in Colorado have to scramble to get back up. But <clears throat> it's not as big a rush because their applications, their delivery, their resources, their services, are geo-distributed across the two data centers. If, on the other hand, data center one were to go down, my production environment is still up. My dev environment, okay, my devs get to go home and claim working compensation for all sorts of mental anguish, but my front-end transac transactional web servers are still up. My databases are still up. My applications are still up. My public-facing websites, my intranet is still up. All of the important services that I need in my environment are still up while the guys at Data Center 1 scramble to get everything working again. Now, I would love for everybody on this call to use only Microsoft technologies, but that is not realistic. We have to be able to acknowledge that VMware is certainly prevalent in our organizations. And when it comes to PDI, Citrix is certainly prevalent in our organizations. And that's okay. We don't want, during a transition phase, and it may take you, if you have 500 servers, it may take you two or three years to transition from VMware to Microsoft. We don't want you to have to use separate tools throughout that transition. We want you to be able to manage everything from one. So we may have an environment and you'll notice here that this Ops Manager workload is telling me that I have a big red X. The, the best advice I can give you if you want to be a, a, at least a decent IT professional, you cannot be colorblind because green is good and red is bad. So here we see in our monitoring that there's a big red X. And of course, if we look down in this corner, this we have one set of computers that is running full hog, 95%. We have another set of computers down here that is running at about 5%. So we're going to balance those workloads using intelligent placement, ops manager, and PRO tips, or performance and resource optimization. We will divide the load more evenly <coughs> and allow it to go green and say, okay, 50% workload on both is a lot better. The performance and resource optimization is what in VMware we call uh, dynamic resource scheduling. That we have the ability during an ongoing live process to just rebalance our workloads intelligently as resources become scarce. We also have the ability to spin up infrastructure as required. So here, if we have the marketing department that has much higher requirements, the marketing director 
can go into their cloud services and request uh, more resources. They say, hey, during the holiday period, we know that we are going to uh, have a lot more web traffic. That request comes to the data center administrator, and the data center administrator has the ability to give them more resources while finance and HR get a little bit less for the time being during their downtime. We have the ability in virtual machine management to spin up services. You know, it's nice that EMM, well, sorry, that the uh, center allows us to spin up virtual machines. And that is hugely important, don't get me wrong. But most of what I do, most of what my clients do, isn't a virtual machine. If they have an application, if they multi-tiered .NET application, they need a SQL server, they need an application server, they need an IIS server, and they want this all to be spun up as one service in their cloud. So we have the ability to just simply go in and build this multi-tier application, and it will spin it up for me as required. And here's what it's going to look like. This is a simple application, and when we spin it up, we see, well, three tiers, and here are the applications and the servers within that tier. But I'm going to see a big red X. Remember, green is good, red is bad. So I'm going to drill down into that red and see what's going on. Let me just make that a little bit bigger for you. We're going to export it to an HTML file, to an XML file. And you know what? I don't know what this says because it starts with the word SQL client call. That's, I'm, I'm a data center administrator. I have SQL guys working with me. So I'm going to forward this code to them and say, hey, we have a problem here. Can you please look into it, fix it, send it back to me? They send it back to me, I correct it, and all of a sudden my tears are green again. Everyone is happy. Now, I heard Sean talking about Microsoft's dreaded blue screen of death. And we've seen over the years that the blue screen of death has gotten a little bit friendlier. It went from looking like this. So looking like this with the emoticon, and that's too bad. Fortunately, in VMware, there is no blue screening. It's purple. So when we have a parity on the good, we also have parity on the bad. It happens, and theirs is just as illegible as ours is. Now, I've talked a lot about the hypervisor, and I've talked about System Center, but let me talk to you about heterogeneous management, because most organizations aren't strictly one platform. If I look at my clients, especially the clients who five years ago were completely VMware, they can't just say, let's migrate over to Hyper-V overnight. They need a tool that's going to manage this heterogeneous environment. And Virtual Machine Manager manages your Hyper-V hosts, but it also manages your VMware environments, and it will manage citrus environments, and all of them will work together. And I can build a private cloud and have profiles that I can build a virtual machine, and it can literally say, okay, do I have better resources on the VMware or on the Hyper-V? And using the same tools, build out the virtual machine on the, next, on the best available resource. How cool is that? Now, here's an interesting question. What does it cost? I'm going to share my screen for a minute. I'm going to make sure I have nothing, in, uh, you know, uh, incriminating on my screen. And it's going to launch my application. Whoops, I don't want to launch my application. I want to go to a new service, and I'm going to look for my cloud economics. And here we go, the private cloud economics calculator. Now, I will tell you off the bat, this is a Microsoft website. So... VMware, this is based on VMware's list price and Microsoft's list price. I'm sure both will give you a deal, but if you have 500 virtual machines in your environment, and we've got 12 virtual machines per CPU, let's see the cost of building this out on Hyper-V versus VMware. And here we see that for VMware and for Microsoft, we're spending $177,000 on Windows licenses. And then you're paying another, wow, just over a million dollars to VMware. Whereas with Windows, with System Center, you're just paying another 88000 
And here's what we don't actually include in that. If you are managing a data center, chances are you're paying for system center anyways because you're using system center operations manager to monitor your exchange servers and your web servers and all sorts of other things in your environment. So we're really talking a factor of six or seven times the cost. That's the only marketing fluff that I'm going to sell you today. Let's get back into views if I can figure out how to do that. Here we go. And you have these tools available for you to try out just to see that I'm not making this up. Test this with your own real numbers and see what it looks like. Now, <clears throat> when I say that Operations Manager monitors everything, it really does because it's a framework for your IT environment. Microsoft lets you, once you have System Center Operations Manager in place, you can then download any of the Microsoft management paths to monitor and manage Windows Server and Active Directory and SQL and IIS and Exchange and you name it. But you can also download or buy third-party management paths for things such as your HP servers and your Dell servers and your, uh, your networking and your Linux machines, and your storage. And oh, by the way, Veeam makes a tool called the, the Veeam Management Pass for VMware, where you can monitor your ESX and vCenter server environment from Operations Manager. So during that two or three year transition, you no longer have to pay for VCOPs or Ranger or whatever you're using to monitor your environment, you can monitor it all again from that single pane of glass and generate the reports from one place rather than having to have another tool. Now, the Assessment and Science Toolkit is one of these tools that I love. It's a free tool from Microsoft that lets you determine what you have and the best path to uh, your migration. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but security is very important. By the way, I'm being mindful of the clock. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, six items that I listened, that I got from Sean's webinar that I do want to address. We'll talk about those at the end. People ask me all the time, you know, Mitch, I have invested all of this money in securing my VMware environment. How do I secure my Hyper-V and operate and system center environment? And here's the brilliant part of it. Microsoft has built security into everything that they've, that they've released for years. Now, we can talk about the early years of Windows Server and Windows 2000, <coughs> but I think we're beyond that. I think we're at the point where everybody can agree that Windows Server is a pretty secure operating environment. So we have to determine what tools we should use to protect ourselves. First of all, I would start at the very basic level using the Windows Firewall. Now, I am not saying get rid of your, of your uh, Cisco, of your Barracuda, of your Checkpoint Firewalls. Don't get me wrong. But to have this defense in depth where I can secure using the same tool, my Hyper-V host, my domain controllers, my mail servers, my clients, and depending on what I'm protecting, I can have my Hyper-V host in one organizational unit and apply a set of group policy objects to that, and my, um, my domain controllers in another organizational unit and apply a different set of group policies to that. I have the ability to do that. I can also minimize my attack footprint by using server core or even Hyper-V server so that there's a lot less patching that has to be done, a lot fewer reboots, and, of course, a lot uh, smaller attack surface, more effective, more efficient. And this can all be managed by group policy objects. Speaking of group policy objects, <coughs> I'm going to come back to that in a minute. The best practice analyzers are tools released by Microsoft for server, for Exchange server, for Hyper-V, for SharePoint, for all of these tools that I, that I equate to having dinner with my mother because I think I'm doing pretty well in life and if I ever get too big for my britches, I go have dinner with my mother and she tells me everything that's wrong with me. 
The best practice analyzer does exactly that. It analyzes your environment and says, hey, these are the industry best practices. These are things that you're breaking. So you have 17 people as domain administrator. We don't recommend you have that many. And it lets us know what we can improve upon ourselves. Unlike dinner with my mother, if you get it all right, then it's going to say everything is good. My mother will just find something else to complain about. And I say that knowing that you'll never listen to this webcast. The security and compliance manager is this great tool, another free tool that Microsoft has released that will help you to build your group policy objects. It will literally take your existing group policies, compare it to industry best practices, and remember, the group policy objects or group policy settings that you have configured for one set of computers won't necessarily apply to another set of computers. So there are different SCM benchmarks for domain controllers and Hyper-V hosts and Exchange servers and mail servers and web servers and so on and so on and so on. And it will take all of those and it will help you to mitigate or remediate your group policies against industry best practices. It will allow you to review them, document them, and keep track of them, and apply them as needed. So that if anybody ever says, hey, can I have a list of my group policy, of our group policy settings, you just pull it out. And if you need to make a change to it, you can look at the exporter results from an Excel spreadsheet, make the change in Excel, and then import it back into your group policy. It is a, a really cool set of free tools that will allow you to uh, configure either your entire domain or standalone machines against industry best practices. Now, I don't want to talk a lot about backups because you know what you have to do to back up your environment. Um, all of the tools work just as well. I happen to like Theme. I have a, something here about Veeam. I like them mostly because A, they have some great tools. B, they sponsor some of my events. But more importantly, for the years that I've been talking about virtualization before Microsoft even, when I was talking about VMware exclusively, Veeam was there. Veeam has been a VMware partner for years, and they've provided virtualization tools for years. So the fact that they're not a Johnny come lately to the virtualization world and that so many of you are using their products with great success shows that their tools are worthwhile. I would look at that. I would probably rate that as my favorite backup tool, the Veeam backup, because if you have a heterogeneous environment, you don't have to worry about different licenses for your Hyper-V hosts and guests versus your VSX hosts and guests. It's all one license. Now, of course, if you're running a homogeneous Microsoft environment, System Center Data Protection Manager backs up everything for you. Most of us have mixed mode environments, and third-party tools will work better. Now, on this slide, at the bottom, we see backup Hyper-V, VMware, and Linux. This is one of the one of the points that I love that VMware talks about that they support a lot more operating systems in their guests than Microsoft does. And it's true. They have a list of 40 or 50 operating systems that they support over what Microsoft supports. Microsoft, out of the box, supports all supported versions of Windows Server and Windows Client, as well as Red Hat Linux and Slash Linux and Ubuntu and CentOS. Now, the Hyper-V integration tools are now built into the Linux core, the Linux kernel, so you can enable them for almost every version of Linux, but that doesn't mean that Microsoft is going to support them. The reason for that is who's supporting what? I, unfortunately, had occasion a few years ago where I had to call VMware support and we had been paying Platinum SNS for this client for years, and they had a Windows NT virtual machine that stopped working. And the support call sounded like this. Now remember, we have been paying their Platinum SNS for years. This was the first time we ever needed it. Okay, so you're having trouble with a virtual machine. First, I'd like you to reinstall the VMware tools. Well, we tried that, and it doesn't fix it. Okay, next we'd like you to try to reinstall the operating system. What? It's Windows NT. 
it's a 17 year old operating system. I don't think I have a media for it anymore. And by the way, if I had the media, I don't have the ability to reinstall the application that's running within it anymore. That's what they call support. I always ask people, you know, Microsoft wrote Windows NP and we don't support it anymore. How can VMware claim to support it, really support it? And the same is true for a lot of operating systems. Who supports FreeBSD? Who supports a lot of these community-driven operating systems? Yes, VMware has VMware tools for them. But the vast majority, I mean, the real vast majority of operating systems in your data centers are supported by Hyper-V. <laughs> and if you call Microsoft for support on one of them, they will never pass the buck. If you have a problem with a Red Hat, a Red Hat Enterprise Linux install, they will support you. They will find the Red Hat engineers within the Microsoft campus, and they will fix the problem for you. That's really cool. Now, we I don't know why Sean spent almost 10 minutes talking about the updating and patch management during his webinar. Microsoft has a spectacular patch management solution, and he made fun of the fact that you have to reboot your Hyper-V hosts in order to patch them. Well, sometimes that's true. More often than not, that's true, and okay. But when you're in a clustered environment, Microsoft failover clustering has gotten so much better over the years, and in Server 2012, failover cluster manager now includes a tool called Cluster Aware Updates. And as I listened to Sean's webcast, on how, how VMware using, as long as you have vCenter server, of course, will put a host into maintenance mode, migrate all of the virtual machines off of that host, patch the host, reboot the host, and then migrate things back on, taking it out of maintenance mode. I was amazed because word for word, that's how cluster aware updates works. So it does everything that VMware's vCenter server does, except failover cluster manager is not part of VMM. It is a free tool within Windows Server 2012. By the way, Server 2012, we have simplified the SKUs of Windows Server. There's no longer 700 different SKUs. There's standard and there's data center. And the difference in features between the two is nil. There is no difference. So you can do clustering on data center. You can do clustering on standard. And you can even do failover clustering on the free Hyper-V Server 2012. Now, I always get somebody in one of my presentations saying, but I have to pay for something somewhere. Theoretically, you don't. If you want to build a two Hyper-V server hosts for free using the free server, go ahead and do it then build as many Linux operating systems on that as you want, up to 1,024 per host, and you've now got a full failover environment that you haven't paid a dime for. That's not true. You have to manage it using a Windows 7 remote server administration tool or Windows 8 remote server administration tool, but that's it. <coughs> I also saw on Shane's webinar that he had trouble with his configuration uh, starting up more than 10 virtual machines in Hyper-V at the same time. And I couldn't help laugh because, as everyone knows, the devil is in the details. And I had watched, he had gone into the settings of some of his virtual machines, and he had set some things up. So I watched that webinar three hours ago. Afterwards, I built on a laptop, which is, by the way, something that we cannot do in VMware at all, I built onto a laptop a Hyper-V demo lab here at the office, and I built 40 virtual machines at the same time. I tweaked their memory, their minimum, their startup, and their maximum RAM accordingly, and I started up 40 virtual machines at the same time on one set of spindles, and it worked just fine. Now, yes, you have to know the product, and that's the difference between hacking and actually knowing it. I apologize. That is not a slight at Sean. Sean is certainly not a hacker, but he doesn't know Hyper-V well enough to really demo it the way I would love to when we go head-to-head. -head. 
He talks about the numbers don't lie. Wow. The numbers don't lie. You know what they say, lies, damn lies, and statistics. You can take any numbers and have them say whatever you want. Numbers do lie. If you look at a lot of the tools that VMware offers and why they say it's better than Hyper-V, well, the numbers don't work in VMware's favor unless they're massaged numbers. But at the same time, I am not going to say that Hyper-V is the panacea. I will bet you that Sean and people from VMware could point to the exact same thing on Microsoft's side and show where we have massage numbers and come up with the same conclusions. So the numbers can lie, the numbers do lie. Um, the next one that he talks about is transparent page sharing. How many ways are there to overcommit resources in VMware versus Hyper-V? And I respect that this is true, but transparent page sharing scares the achievers out of me. I, coming from my military and security background, look at this and say, see an opportunity for a hacker one day to compromise every virtual machine on my host in a nanosecond bypassing every bit of network security that I've implemented. I like being able to overcommit my resources, but there is a point where I need to make sure that I'm overcommitting them safely and securely. And where Microsoft beats VMware on that is VMware says you should never overcommit more than 10 to 15% of your memory. Microsoft's numbers are a lot higher because the way they do it is a lot more efficient. Now, Shane, Sean, and company will say, yeah, but VMware's been doing all of this longer, and Microsoft has only really come to the game in Hyper-V Server 2012. To which I ask everybody on the call today, raise your hand if you have a Marconi radio. Hold on a second. Marconi invented the radio. Marconi's been doing radio longer than anyone else. How could you possibly have an RCA of those? Anyone else who may do it as well now, but Marconi did it first. See what I'm getting at? It's not a question. Microsoft came late to the virtualization game. As for Virtual Server 2005, I apologize for that. It was a layer two hypervisor. As for Hyper-V Server 2008, it was a good first generation, lacking. Second generation, better. We're now in generation three. Now, we don't call it Hyper-V3, but we really is the third generation. And if you look at all of the skeptics, everyone at Microsoft, everyone says about Microsoft, you know what? They never get it right until the third generation. Welcome to the generation where Microsoft got virtualization right. Now, there's one more thing I want to talk about because Sean talked about paying for upgrades and you have to buy every new version of Windows Server and you have to buy every new version of System Center, whereas if you bought uh, server, uh, bought VMware 3.0, excuse me, and have maintained your Platinum SNS for all of these years, you can be able to upgrade for free for, through every generation. To which I ask Sean, has he ever heard of software assurance? Because that is exactly what the software assurance is. If you bought it seven, eight, nine years ago, you have upgrade rights to the new version forever. That's the way Microsoft works. And it's not only for server, and it's not only for system center. It's for every enterprise product that is available. So there's a parity, but there's a, there are several misconceptions out there in the virtualization world. And I hope that I have been able to, um, to dispel some of these myths. Now, we have the ability to, to add in all of the self-provisioning and to do it yourself. And I can talk on and on about how Hyper-V has gotten better over the years. Instead of doing that, I am going to give you a little bit of time back. It's 2.53. Now, uh, on, the, on the East Coast, I assume on the West Coast, it's uh, coming up to noon. I am going to give you some time back. And just to show a great little analogy, Sean went over time by about 15 minutes. And that's respectable because he did a lot of demos, and I only did PowerPoint something about my firewall here at Microsoft. 
VMware and Hyper-V do a lot of things exactly the same, but it's just simpler on the Microsoft side. All of the tools on the Microsoft side look like they do in Active Directory, look like they do in Outlook. So you don't have to learn a new interface. You don't have to teach people again. Virtualization is, is the, maybe the future, but as far as which hypervisor is better, it doesn't matter. Hypervisors are a commodity. It's the manageability, the management tools, the private cloud, the public cloud ability where you are going to save your money. And with that, hands down, Microsoft's Hyper-V wins with System Center 2012. I'm going to open the floor to questions, and I want to thank you very much for spending the time to, to listen and talk with me today.